Good evening, everyone. It's a very great pleasure to welcome you here this evening on behalf of the Institute for Human Sciences here in Vienna. My name is Ivan Vejvoda. I'm the acting rector of the Institute. We have gathered here this evening for the annual Jan Patochka Memorial. This is a series, one of our oldest series at the Institute that began in 1987, and this is the 32nd lecture, believe it or not. Our first speaker was Hans-Georg Gadamer. Other speakers, I won't mention them all, were Edward Said, François Furet, Albert Hirschman, Jacques Derrida, Leszek Kolakowski, and many others. It is no surprise, I think, for many of you that Patochka was a famous Czech philosopher. He was the spokesperson of the Charter 77, uh, which is famous, of course, for Václav Havel's participation and many other Czech dissidents. And the stories uh, that link the events that we are going to hear about tonight and Patochka, of course, it's about two totalitarian states, two of the darkest period of the 20th century of European history. And Patochka died uh, after a lengthy interrogation by the Czech or Slovak Secret Service in 1977. Of course, you will hear about the other totalitarianism, its after effects and consequences in the speech of our guest speaker at the Patochka Memorial, uh, Philippe Sanz. Uh, about whom I'll say a few things and keeping it short so that we hear him. I would like to uh, here mention one person, that's Shalini Randeria, the former elector, my great friend and many, friend of many of ours and colleagues. But she is culpable for bringing Philip Sands on behalf of the Institute uh, in 2019 when Philippe was here to present his book, East West Street, which of course is the foundational part of the story that you will hear tonight. That event in December 19 was when COVID was starting to brew in a faraway part of the world. And that same COVID in fact impeded us, impeded Cialini and the Institute to bring Philip because believe it or not, we had delayed three times running and uh, being so close, like many of us, to Shalini at the Institute, we participated in these endless email exchanges, plans, COVID rules, traffic, airline, and all this. That all is to say that finally we do have Philippe with us tonight, and it gives us really a great pleasure that he is here and that he is spending a few days in Vienna. Let me just say, two words about East West Street. This was, for me personally, I think for many of us who are not international uh, legal experts, and that is what Philippe is. He is a professor of international law at University College London. He is a barrister at Maastricht's Chambers and is someone uh, who has followed, for example, the International Court uh, for the former Yugoslavia, which is my former country that disappeared in uh, in front of me, another evil part of European history that should not have happened as far as I concerned. But this is to say that there are many things that come together here. East West Street, and I will only mention this, is something that I think I learned so much and I believe we all have, and that is to understand that the terms genocide and crimes against humanity were actually invented and came about by individuals who were trying to define and give a framework for these horrendous things that were happening in 20th century history. Hirsch Lauterpacht and Raphael Lemkin. These are names that took me quite a bit of time to remember. <laughs> They're tough, even though I read the book very studiously. I had to write them down and sort of memorize them. And here I am, I'm able to say them without looking at the piece of paper. So I urge you to do the same, because if you have not read East West Street, that is really where all this brewing comes together. And I will only add what makes it additionally fascinating is that Philippe Sands weaves the story of his family with the stories of the good guys and the bad guys. Let me keep it very colloquial. And what is fascinating as well is that all this starts in a city that was formerly part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Lemberg, Lviv, Lvov, 
uh, many names that it has had since powers that controlled it change. And that is where Philippe, by a chance, he might tell you that story, how it all happened that he went to give a lecture there and that prompted him to do it. But tonight we are here to listen to uh, a story about part two, the rat line, Love, Lies and Justice on the Trail of a Nazi Fugitive. I end by saying that we have two booksellers here outside who are selling English original copies and the German translation, and these books uh, are signed, uh, most of them. So please, if you feel uh, incited by what you hear tonight, you can do that. Once again, thank you so much for coming, and thank you so much to Philippe Sands, who is here with us tonight. Philippe, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is incredibly nice to be here, finally. I express my deep thanks to you, acting rector, and of course the former rector and the institute and MAK for your persistence, uh, for not giving up. It's extraordinary. I am incredibly happy to be back in Vienna. It's a city that's of great importance uh, to me. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real privilege to be invited to deliver this lecture in honor of Jan Batochka. I, of course, first came across him in relation to the remarkable work he did, it became Charter 77, which was, I think, uh, an important step on the road to modern international justice. He is so closely associated with issues of principle, with issues of moral justice. It is, he wrote, in 1977, morality that defines what being human means. And morality includes an obligation to resist injustice. And that entails the opportunity to inform anyone whatever about any injustice to which an individual is subjected. Those are his words. To speak and to be able to share information and to talk about ideas is to promote morality and justice. To do so here in Vienna is not without significance for me, for it was here in this extraordinary city that my mother was born in July 1938, three months after the Anschluss. She was born into a place called Ostmark, it had been incorporated into Germany's Third Reich, ruled by Reichstatthalter Arthur Seiss Inkwart, with Ernst Kaltenbrunner as chief minister, Josef Birkel as commissioner responsible for the Jewish question, and State Secretary Otto Wächter, charged with removing all Jews from public office. With the exception of Seiss Inkwart and Kaltenbrunner, convicted of crimes against humanity by the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, whose 75th anniversary of the judgment is marked this week, and then sentenced to death and hanged on October the 16th, 1946, none of those names were known to me. Despite my Austrian origins as a child and for decades beyond, I didn't inquire too much about such matters. And then, as the acting rector mentioned, in the autumn of 2010, I received an unexpected invitation to deliver a lecture at the law faculty in the city of Lemberg, Lviv, Lvov, Lvuf, on my work on crimes against humanity and genocide, two international crimes, the terms for which were coined in the summer of 1945. I spent the summer writing up my lectures, and in the course of that, I accidentally discovered the man who put crimes against humanity into international law, <laughs> Professor Hirsch Lauterpack, happened to come from Lviv. Indeed, he had been a student at the university that invited me, although those who did invite me to Lviv were blissfully unaware of that fact. And later, he studied at the University of Vienna, 
under Hans Kelsen. Incidentally, I spent part of this morning at the Jewish Museum looking at the rather wonderful uh, exhibition of Hans Kelsen uh, and his role in the drafting of the remarkable Austrian constitution, and I thank the person who directed me uh, to the fact that there was such an exhibit. That summer, I also learned that the man who invented the word genocide, Raphael Lemkin, was also a student at the law faculty in Lemberg, Lvov, although not at the same time as Lauterpacht. Those who invited me didn't know that either. And then I learned that at the Nuremberg trial, probably the most famous trial in history, Lauterpacht and Lemkin were actually part of the prosecution teams on behalf of the British and Americans, respectively. And they prosecuted Hans Frank for crimes against humanity and genocide. But what they did not know, remarkably, when the trial opened on November the 20th, 1945, was that the man they were prosecuting, Hans Frank, had been responsible for the deaths of their entire families. Ostensibly, I traveled to Lemberg to give a lecture, but the true reason for the journey was a desire to find the house where my grandfather was born. You can see him on the screen. In 1904, Leon Buchholz's city was known as Lemberg, a regional capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I wanted to fill gaps in his life story. This is his school identity card from Vienna from 1914, to discover what happened to his family, about which he maintained a discreet silence. I wanted to learn about his identity and mine. I found Leon's house, and I discovered the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity, that remarkably they could be traced to the city of Lemberg, Lvov. And this caused me to write a first book, East West Street, which some in the audience may have read. But you may be less familiar with this book, which is its sequel, if you like, although you can read them in either order. The Rat Line, published just a few months ago in German with the title Die Ratten und Nier. The two books tell stories, and like the cases in which I'm involved at international courts, they inevitably touch on personal stories. And I suppose what I've come to be really interested in is that special connection between the minutiae of personal stories and the larger canvas of the big political, legal, public story, an intellectual exercise. That's what really interests me. East West Street and the Rat Line are part of a broader project helping make international law reach a broader audience. That's incredibly important right now, as so many countries, not least the United Kingdom and the United States, have recently moved away from their commitment to the 1945 settlement, to the idea of a rules-based global order. In writing East West Street, I have met some extraordinary human beings. Two people that I've met in the past decade are the sons of two leading Nazis who were directly involved in the extermination of Lauterpach's family, Lemkin's family, and my grandfather's family. He was the only survivor of a family of 80 who had come from Lemberg. Nicholas Frank, the son of Hans Frank, who had been Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer, and Horst Wächter, the son of Otto Wächter, who was Hans Frank's deputy governor, deputy, and served as governor first of Krakow and then of District Galicia. I met them totally unexpectedly. I wasn't looking for their personal stories. The context is as follows. In the 1960s, my brother and I would often visit our grandparents, who lived in Paris near the Gare du Nord. As children, we came to understand that for our grandparents, the past was a painful thing, and that we shouldn't ask too many questions. Their apartment was a place of silence, a place haunted by secrets from Lemberg and from Vienna. I only really began to understand what had happened about these silences 10 years ago, as a consequence of that trip to Lviv. I learned about legal history and of the terrible events that occurred there, unleashed by words. Words really matter, the words spoken by Hans Frank. 
who was the governor general of Nazi-occupied Poland. The words I'm thinking of were spoken on a warm day, the 1st of August, 1942, and they were directed to his deputy, Otto Wächter from Vienna, sitting in the front row, who had recently transferred to Lemberg and was now the new governor of district, Galicia. Hans Frank's words began the process that led within days to the extermination of hundreds of thousands of Jews and Poles. And Frank, in due course, was charged with crimes against humanity and genocide. And he was hanged in the courtyard of Nuremberg's Palace of Justice exactly 75 years ago. East West Street isn't about the life of one individual, but four. And it seeks to understand how the particular circumstances of each of the four, my grandfather Leon, Lauterpacht, Lemkin, Frank, contributed to the roads they took and how the different roads they traveled changed the system of international law that is my daily work and the daily work of so many others, including many people, no doubt, in this room. Those of you who've read the book will know that it also touches on a far more personal theme, how these four interweaving lives influenced the path that I have taken, either directly or indirectly. Below my path and your paths, of course, for each of us, lurk some pretty big questions, questions that each of us asks. They address the most central questions of human identity, so relevant right now. Who am I? How do I want to be defined as an individual or as a member of a group or both? And how do I want the law to extend its protective embrace as an individual or as a member of a group? It may have been my work as a barrister rather than my writings that caused the invitation to arrive from Lviv. In the summer of 98, I'd been peripherally involved in the negotiations in Rome that led to the creation of the Statute of the International Criminal Court, a body that would have jurisdiction over genocide and crimes against humanity and two other crimes. The essential difference between the two concepts centers on who is protected and why. If 10,000 human beings are killed, murdered, exterminated, their systematic killing will always be a crime against humanity. But will it be a genocide? That depends on the intentions of the killers and the ability of prosecutors to prove that intention. To establish the crime of genocide in law, you have to prove that the act of killing is motivated by a special intent, the intent to destroy a group in whole or in part. The criminal prosecutor can't prove that a large number of people have been killed with that special intent, then the crime of genocide is not established. And so basically, you've got these two crimes operating side by side and overlapping. Every genocide is also going to be a crime against humanity, but not every crime against humanity is a genocide. A few months after the two crimes were inscribed into the statute of the ICC, Senator Augusto Pinochet was arrested in London on charges of genocide and crimes against humanity, laid against him by a Spanish prosecutor. The House of Lords in London ruled that even as a former president of Chile, he was not entitled to claim immunity from the English courts. That was a wholly novel, unprecedented, and revolutionary judgment. In the years that followed after 1998, the gates of international justice slowly creaked open after five decades of quiet during the Cold War chill that descended from Nuremberg. Cases from the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda soon landed on my desk in London. Others followed on allegations in the Congo, Libya, Chechnya, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Sierra Leone, Guantanamo, Palestine, Israel, Iraq, and so the list goes on and on. But they were always based, each of these cases, on the rules that came into being in 1945, an American invention, a revolutionary moment in the making of modern international law, a moment that began in courtroom 600 of Nuremberg's Palace of Justice, when it was recognized for the first time in human history that the rights of the sovereign, the president, the emperor, were not unlimited. This long and sad list of cases that reached me, of course, reflected the failure of good intentions 
aired in Nuremberg's courtroom 600. And so I became involved in too many cases of mass killing. I have seen too many mass graves. Some of the cases were crimes against humanity, the killing of individuals on a large scale. Others were about genocide, the killings of a group. These two distinct crimes, with their different emphases on the individual and the group, grew side by side. Although over time, genocide seems to have emerged in the eyes of many as the crime of crimes, a hierarchy that leaves a suggestion that the killing of large numbers of people as individuals rather than as a group is somehow less terrible. One of the major characters behind this story and in East West Street is Hans Frank's son, Nicholas. He's a very fine journalist and a writer, and he absolutely despises his father. The first time I met him, he said to me, you know, Philippe, I'm against the death penalty in all cases, except in the case of my father. And a few months later, he introduced me to Horst Arthur Wächter, the son of his father's deputy, Otto Wächter, an Austrian and also a cultured and very highly educated lawyer. Wächter, the father, was indicted for the mass murder of more than 100,000 Poles and Jews. But unlike Hans Frank, Otto Wächter was never caught. He died in Rome in 1949 in the arms of a Vatican bishop, Alois Hudol, in mysterious and unexpected circumstances. Nicholas Frank said to me, hmm, Philippe, you will like Horst, although he is different from me. He loves his father. And so, in the spring of 2012, I made the first of what would be many visits to Hagenberg, just a little north of Vienna, to the dilapidated ancient 12th century castle in the tiny village an hour or so from here. Horst, who is in his early 70s, is genial and chatty. He wears a pink shirt and Birkenstocks the first time I meet him. We talk, we eat, we drink. He speaks of his parents' Nazi beliefs, his love for his mother, Charlotte. She was a Nazi until the day she died. Horst's wife, Jacqueline, will whisper into my ear on one of those visits. And he had a childhood of plenty. Horst says of himself, and I quote, I was a Nazi child. I was named in honor of the Horst Wessel song and Arthur Seiss Ingvard, who ran Austria briefly after the Anschluss and then became governor of German-occupied Holland until 1945. Interestingly, that's, I think, the reason that the book became a bestseller in the Netherlands. Arthur Seiss Ingvart was Horst's godfather. And Horst has a photograph of Seiss Ingvart next to his bed, still to this day. Horst will say to me, you know what, Philippe? I hardly knew my father, but it is my duty as a son to find the good in him. On that first visit, Horst shares with me family albums filled with black and white photos from the 1930s and 1940s. There are images of family holidays on lakes and mountains, interspersed with the occasional swastika or a picture of Adolf Hitler, a haunting photograph of a child taken in the Warsaw Ghetto. The albums make it clear that the Wächter sat at the top Nazi table. There is also a huge collection of his parents' diaries and letters and Charlotte's reminiscences, but it will take some years before I see these. I leave at the end of that first visit, over a couple of days, totally intrigued by Horst and his family papers. And the thing is, I have to say, as Nicholas predicted, I liked him. A year passes. I write a profile of Horst for the Financial Times newspaper. Horst doesn't like the article, which has the title, My Father, the Good Nazi. And he breaks off our relations, but then returns. And this will become a pattern. The article catalyzes a commission from the BBC to make a documentary feature film, What Our Fathers Did 
a Nazi legacy. Horst will tell me he doesn't like the title. He would prefer what our fathers did and did not do. The film traces my relationship with Nicholas and Horst, and it takes us together to the city of Lemberg, Lviv, in the summer of 2014. Horst doesn't like the film, and once again severs relations, but returns again. There is one scene in the film that really irritates and upsets him. It's filmed in Lviv, in the city archives, and Nicholas Frank wonders aloud whether Horst could be one of these new kind of Nazis. Nicholas retracts that charge later on, but it sticks in the gullet. And Horst wants to counter the claim. I don't think of you as a Nazi, I say to him. You are not a Holocaust denier. You are not a racist. You are not an anti-Semite. And he asks me a question. How can I prove that I'm not a Nazi? It's difficult always to prove a negative. Any lawyer will tell you that. And so I take a little bit of time to reflect on the question. Why not, I suggest, why not give the entire family archive to a museum? And in that way, scholars and others who are interested in your family and the materials from that time can review it. After all, Nazis tend not to act in that way. It seems, from what I know at that point, without having seen it, to be a unique collection, one that traces completely the life of a leading Nazi couple from the moment they met in 1929 on the 6th of April here in Vienna at the train station to the moment that Otto died two decades later in Rome. Horst agrees. He offers the material to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and it becomes part of their collection. And as of today, you can all go and see it on the web from the comfort of your homes. It is a unique and astonishing collection. There is simply nothing else like it. At that time, Horst says to me, would I like a set? I say, yes, I'd love a set. And a few days later, a single USB stick drops through my letterbox in London, a tatty old recycled envelope. 13 gigabytes of digital images, 8,677 pages of letters, postcards, diaries, photographs, newspaper clippings, and official documents. It includes Charlotte's Erinnerungen memoirs, written for Horst and the couple's five other children after the war. The reminiscences are grouped by time period, 1938 to 1942, 1942 to 1945, and so on. Unbelievably, there are also old sound recordings, and those tapes are digitized, so I'm actually able to listen to Charlotte in her German cadence, methodical, rhythmic, high-pitched, anxious. It's not, I think, a warm and cozy voice. This amazing material allows me to see the private side of Governor Wächter's terrible work in occupied Poland, in Krakow and Lemberg, from 1939 to 1944. What did Wächter do exactly? Why did he travel to Rome in the spring of 1949? And what caused his death there at the relatively young age of 48? And what did Charlotte actually know about what her husband did? And how much did she, as a spouse, actually provide by way of support? In fact, what sort of a relationship did they have? The material is voluminous, and much of it is handwritten, and it's all in German. It lingers for many weeks until one day my colleague, the very wonderful but late and remarkable historian, Lisa Jardine intercedes. She has recently delivered her inaugural lecture at University College London, where I teach, with a wonderful title, Temptation in the Archives. I love archival material, and so does she. How do you assess archival material of a personal nature? That is what Lisa Jardine does. What's the historical value 
of personal documents. At that point, Lisa already had terminal cancer. But she summoned a few of us to her flat in the shadow of the British Museum in the heart of London. Bring a few documents, she said. I bring a few documents. She's very interested in the personal correspondence and the diaries. She's struck by the sheer number of letters written in the last months of Otto Wächter's life while he was on the run, a hunted man. And she asks a question. Why would a husband and wife write to each other so often, at such length and in such detail? I don't know, I say. Maybe because they loved each other? Lisa pauses and says, no, I don't think so. I think there's more there. They are sharing things that they don't want others to see. The letters last from the moment the war ended, on the 9th of May 1945, after the war, to the entire period while he was on the run, four and a half years. And all of it is coded. There are no names. Focus on the last year of Otto's life, Lisa suggests, and the nature of Charlotte's role, and let's see what emerges. And so begins another research project, one that lasts about four years, an exploration of what lay between the lines and behind the words. I stumble into a world of escape and of espionage, of double dealing and of duplicity, of exhumations and reburials. I travel from the Vatican to Syria and South America and end up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I visit monasteries. I travel across lakes and mountains. And finally, I arrive at the world of the rat line, the Reich migratory route, as it was called. The escape paths used by Nazis to make their way from Italy to Argentina and other places in South America. What I will learn is barely imaginable, for me at least. It's a story of love and of lies and of justice and injustice. A couple fleeing from the prospect of discovery and arrest of charge and of trial, of sentencing and of the hangman's noose. At the heart of this story is a relationship, one that survived, Charlotta believed, because in her words, our love had no limits and went even beyond death. Charlotta is, for me, both fascinating and repugnant. She was born into a wealthy family of steelmakers in a small Styrian town of Mürzerschlag, and she was, on her own account, a very difficult and highly rebellious child, intelligent but not intellectual. She enrolled as a student here in Vienna at the Women's Academy and School for Free and Applied Art and developed a very fine artistic eye, helped by wonderful teachers who included Josef Hoffmann of the Wiener Werkstätte. Her career blossomed. She designed fabrics, and she sold them with some success in Germany and Britain. She's also a champion sportswoman, and in the spring of 1929, she travels to the local Schneeberg ski resort and shares a train compartment with a stranger, a strikingly handsome young lawyer. My new baron, she will call him, tall, slender, athletic, with delicate features and very beautiful hands. He wore a diamond ring on the little finger of his right hand and had a noble appearance, one that any girl would notice. On the 6th of April, 1929, she writes, the day she met him, I fell in love with good-looking, cheerful Otto. They courted for three years, and then they married because she had fallen pregnant. He has begun to practice as a lawyer in this city, and he becomes increasingly active in the leadership of the Austrian chapter of the Nazi party. She totally supports and indeed encourages his politics. In the summer of 1934, it is Otto Wächter who was the leader of the unsuccessful coup attempt on the government of Austrian Chancellor Engelbert Dollfuss. The coup attempt fails. He flees to Berlin and joins the criminal division of the SD, the Sicherheitsdienst, the intelligence service of the Schutzstaffel, the SS. And he works in the same building as Adolf Eichmann. 
entering the personal orbit of Heinrich Himmler, who becomes his patron. Charlotte, Charlotte joins him in 1936 with Horst's two oldest siblings. In March 1938, Germany seizes Austria and they are able to return home. Every Nazi felt such joy about this miracle, she will say. Four years after the failed coup, he's back in triumph. She drives to Vienna to pave the way for her gorgeous husband's return. There he was, she writes, in the doorway of my parents' flat in Vienna, a Brigadeführer in his black coat with white lapels and uniform. And, she adds, in spite of the strain and the fatigue, he looked absolutely splendid. They make their way to the Hofburg Palace through huge crowds overcome with, as Charlotte puts it, a spontaneous and heartfelt outburst of joy. Sy Sinkvart and his wife and a number of others came with the Führer. We slowly climbed the stairs of the Hofburg up to the balcony, and there he was, the Führer, standing just a meter in front of me. I could see him and hear him so well. I looked long and hard for a photograph of Otto Wächter on the balcony, and for five years I found nothing. And then last week, a couple of weeks ago, a colleague in New Zealand found this photograph of Wächter on the balcony close to the Führer. You see him two to the left in the top corner. After that moment, they entered the room, walked down the magnificent marble balcony, a staircase inside, and at the bottom of the staircase, Otto says to Charlotte, now my darling, I have a choice. Do I continue with my legal practice or do I instead join the government? And it is, I think, Charlotte who says, don't go back to the life of a lawyer. Single moments can have a decisive consequence in life. That fateful decision will have huge consequences, not just for Otto and for Charlotte, but for their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. Charlotte's diaries, interestingly, pass in complete silence on the substance of Otto's new position. As state secretary, his job is to remove all Jews and other undesirables from public office, from the federal chancellery at the top to the postal service down at the bottom. He axed thousands and thousands of individuals, more than 16 and a half thousand people lost their positions. And amongst them, unbelievably, are two individuals who were known to him personally, Professor Joseph Hupka and Professor Stefan Braslov. These were his own teachers here in Vienna. And Professor Hupka actually signed his graduation certificate and his degree. And Wächter removed him from his post. Both men were stripped of their jobs, of their pension rights. Both men were shortly after that deported. And both men very soon perished. They did not return. As a professor of law, this kind of image, as you can imagine, is deeply affecting. As Otto crosses lines, Charlotte offered unstinting support. She just loves the perks, the Mercedes, the cocktail parties, the concerts at the Salzburg Festival and at Bayreuth in the presence of the Führer and Himmler. And she loves the new homes here in Vienna and at Zell am See, where they acquire a small summer house, just 16 hectares, previously owned by the governor of Salzburg, who's now at Ravensbrück concentration camp. 
The arrival of war in September 1939 propels Otto's career to even greater heights and even greater horrors. Seiss Inkwart it is who procures the new position for Otto. He becomes governor of Krakow in Western Poland, newly occupied by Germany, working under Hans Frank. And the thing that is amazing is that Charlotte is fully aware of what he is up to because he writes about it in the letters home. Here's a letter from December the 30th, 17th, 1939. Dear Humption, many thanks for your lovely letter. There's a lot going on here. On the one hand, we've had some lovely things in the last few days. Chirac, General Arbeitsführer Polenz, R. M. Funk, and the Vienna Philharmonic was a great success, and so also a great success for me. Frank was very impressed. On the other hand, not such nice things. Sabotage, a nasty business, car accidents, and ultimately an attempt on the life of the Governor General. Tomorrow, I have to have another 50 poles shot. That's just a regular letter home. The act of killing was notorious. It was the first act of reprisal personally ordered by Adolf Hitler in occupied Poland. And it was Otto who signed off on it and who supervised its implementation. It was Otto who signed off on acts against the city's Jews and the Polish intellectuals. And it was Otto who ordered and oversaw the construction of the Krakow ghetto. It was for these and other acts he would be indicted by the Americans and the Poles for mass murder, for crimes against humanity and genocide. I looked over four years across 8,677 pages for a hint of regret in Charlotte's expressions or in his, and I found, and my assistants found, not a single sign. Three years later, the Krakow job completed, Charlotte celebrates when Hitler appoints Otto to Lemberg to clean up district Galicia, which has recently been occupied by Germany following Operation Barbarossa. And again, Otto keeps her abreast of developments. There was so much to do in Lemberg after you left. The harvest was gathered. We sent Polish workers to the labor camps, more than 250,000 already in just a few weeks. And the current large Jewish operations, the Juden Aktionen, have been implemented. Lots of love forever. Himmler visits and offers him a position back here in Vienna if he doesn't feel he's up to the job in Lemberg. No, he says, I want to stay. I want to see it through. And I quote from his letter to Charlotte, I was almost embarrassed about how positively Himmler talks about me. But life isn't perfect. Manual labor proves to be difficult to find, he tells his wife, because the Jews are being deported in increasing numbers and it's so awfully hard to get powder for the tennis court. That is an actual quote from a letter home. As the deportations and exterminations proceed, Charlotte writes of picnics and of concerts, and it is this disconnect between horror and beauty that makes so compelling and disconcerting a read in these diaries and letters. Carefully read, Charlotte's diaries will throw up other secrets. She was working as a volunteer nurse at a hospital in Lemberg, and she records in English, because Otto can't read English, that she has lost her heart to a young soldier called Horst. And then in the spring of 1942, just as the final solution is beginning to be implemented, unbelievably, she actually falls in love with Otto's boss, Hans Frank. I send the pages of the diary to Hans Frank's son, Nicholas. Sensational, he writes, a little mischievously, 
Perhaps Horst and I are brothers. <laughs> the letters trace the last bitter months and weeks of the war. And even at the most acute moments, as the Red Army approaches Lemberg and the end nears, Charlotte and Otto find tons of time to write to each other and to hope. And she is truly an Anglophile. The British are even more nationalist than the Germans, she has told her husband in 1932. And so now, 13 years later, she imagines a possible new ally in the struggle against the dreaded Soviets. I so hope the English will be fed up and finally unite with us, she writes to her husband. Nah, it's not going to happen, she continues. There's an impediment. The Jews, always getting involved, always contaminating everything. On 9th of May 1945, the war is over. Otto is indicted for mass murder, and he simply disappears off the face of the earth. His name is in the papers, Austrian and worldwide, indicted, listed as a wanted war criminal with his friend Seiss Inkwart, who is caught and will be put on trial at Nuremberg, convicted and executed. To survive, we learn from this archive, Otto now has to rely on Charlotte. And this is interesting in terms of family dynamics and relations. In a 20-year marriage, I think it's fair to say that in the first 15 years, Otto was in control. But now, after 1945, all of a sudden, it's Charlotte who has the power. The tables have been turned, and a new chapter opens. Evasion and escape require friends and allies in the Vatican and beyond, and Charlotte's papers provide secret details of how Otto escaped, including the time he spent hiding in the Austrian mountain with a young companion, a former SS soldier, Burkhard Hartmann, who the family call Buko. I ask Horst about Bucco. What did Bucco do during the war? What was he like? Why did he help your father? You want to know about Bucco? Horst asks. I nod. Well, Horst says, I can answer all of your questions and I can tell you everything about Bucco, or we could telephone him. Unbelievably, in 2017, Buko Ratman is alive and well, 92 years old. You can see him here in the middle of the photograph. And he invited us to visit very generously. There was one condition, which is that we ask no questions about anything that happened before the 9th of May 1945, because it turns out that Buko wakes up every morning and worries he's going to be indicted and arrested for what he did in former Yugoslavia and in Italy. Buko, it is, I have to say, unbelievable to be sitting with someone who can tell you this firsthand. It is one of the most extraordinary experiences I have ever had. Told me how they escaped, how they hid in the mountains of Austria for three years, moving from hut to hut, how they followed every day from above 2,000 meters the Nuremberg trials, how they read of the outcome, the convictions, the sentences of death, the hanging of all of Otto's friends and colleagues, Hans Frank, Seiss Inquart, Kalten Puna. How did Otto react to the news of the hangings? I asked. Vi victis, Bucco says wistfully, to the victor, the spoils. And as Bucco spoke to me, I had my eye on a small black and white photograph on the bookshelf behind him. It was just too far for me to see exactly what it was. But eventually, I could see after the interview that it was a man seated, pensive, with a swastika draped around his arm, a photograph of Adolf Hitler on his bookshelf in January 2017 in central Germany. After Otto left Bucco 
after three years together in the summer of 1948, he made his way south to Salzburg, to Innsbruck, across the mountains and into Italy, and he used a false identity. He has now taken on the name of Alfredo Reinhardt, who is an Austrian acquaintance. The Reinhardts are from Salzburg. We did a little bit of research on Alfred Reinhardt, member of the SS, who actually did escape to Argentina in 1947. The correspondence with Charlotte provides all the details of how someone makes their way on the run. The friends and lovers who provide refuge and assistance, the dramatic arrival in Rome, greeted by senior Vatican figures, including a, and I quote, very positive religious gentleman, unquote, who has connections, he says, right to the very top. And from this correspondence, which is all anonymized, we eventually work out every person that he met with and hung out with, what the Americans were doing in Rome, who their new friends and allies were, and how the new war, the Cold War, ensnared Otto what exactly the Americans knew about his whereabouts and when. The path to the rat line comes into view and it is a deeply troubling one. It's so troubling, in fact, that I took counsel from my neighbor in North London, in Hampstead, who is the writer of spy novels, John le Carre. He invites me to tea. I arrive with six small cakes, a handful of Otto's letters and some photographs. We sit in his living room as the sun streams in across, papers that are laid out on a sofa and a low table, and Le Carre says to me, you know why this is interesting? I was there in 1949. I didn't know that, I said. Yep, I was a young British soldier, and my job was to interrogate Nazis. For what purpose, I asked, to prosecute them? No, he says, my job was to recruit them, and it was bewildering. I'd been brought up to hate Nazis and all that stuff, and then all of a sudden I'm told that we've turned on a sixpence and the great new enemy is the Soviet Union. Now I was told the Nazis are our friends. It was extremely perplexing. This is just three years after the end of the Nuremberg trial. So why did I, as an international lawyer, engage in this project? What is it about the Wächters? that captured my imagination. There aren't simple answers to these questions, but it seems clear that it goes to the interrelationship of matters of memory and identity. That's the case for Horst, the memorialization and construction of an idealized image of his parents. But it's also the case for me too, I suppose, a journey that has taken me back to the untold story of my grandfather so that I could better understand who he was, my grandfather, and who I am. My interest in the Wächters is surely a consequence of the connection with my own family from Vienna and Lemberg, for Wächter was directly involved in actions that contributed to the extermination of my grandfather's entire family in Lemberg, as I mentioned. My desire to excavate the memories of others is intended to fill gaps and to replace silences, and that, of course, is motivated in large part by matters of identity. And there is, too, the implication of Otto Wächter's story for our conceptions of justice and for the present. Otto Wächter died alone in this room. Eventually, I was given access in the Vatican-run Santo Spiritu Hospital with the help of a Vatican cardinal and a Vatican bishop who were remarkably supportive of this project I finally got to visit that room. Wächter was charged, but he was never tried and convicted. And that fact creates an important space, one that can be occupied by the Wächter family and by his son Horst. All the guilty ones have been judged, he once said to me. As far as he was concerned, the names of those responsible for crimes were fully documented and since none of the lists of those tried and convicted included his father's name, it followed that he must be an innocent man. Everything else, Horst says, is pure imagination. And of course, that's the untold story of Nuremberg and the untold story of every other expression of formalized international criminal justice. 
Rwanda, Yugoslavia, Argentina, Chile, Kosovo, the list goes on and on. One of the unintended consequences of more or less every legislative or judicial act, inclusio unius est exclusio alterius, to include one is to exclude the other. By memorializing certain facts in the Nuremberg judgment, you inadvertently memorialize the acts of others by silencing them. And this silence allowed Charlotta to live the rest of her life on the constructed and imagined artifice that her husband was actually a rather decent man. And that was the reality she passed on to her son. As you will discover, however, in the rat line, the baton of innocence is not passed on endlessly to all future generations. There is, too, to explain my interest in the Wächters, the connection with my other work, my day job, if you like, the cases that I do before international courts and tribunals. A year ago, I pondered this matter as I was sitting in the Great Hall of Justice, the International Court of Justice in The Hague, I was lead counsel for the Gambia in a case against Myanmar on the allegations of mistreatment in relation to the Rohingya. You will have read about it in your newspapers, especially because of events in Myanmar and the latest coup. In that great hall of justice, as you can see from this photograph, which I took, I sat literally a few feet from Aung San Suu Kyi, the Nobel Peace Laureate, as she tried to persuade the judges of the ICJ that the Myanmar's military actions against the Rohingya community might be a tad excessive, the odd war crime here and there perhaps, she acknowledged a little bit grudgingly, but most definitely not acts of genocide. At the provisional measures phase, not one of the 17 judges was persuaded. And as I was sitting there, literally, a couple of meters from her, I was asking myself, how could it be that Aung San Suu Kyi, Nobel laureate, could not see the facts as so many others did? Some who know her believe the reason probably lies in matters of family, that they arise from her relationship with her father, who was the architect of Burmese independence, the founder of the Tat Mador, Myanmar's armed forces, and he was assassinated just six months before Burma became Myanmar and obtained independence. As she addressed the court, just a few feet from me, looking impeccable with flowers in her hair, speaking so fluently, I thought of Horst and Charlotte and Otto. And so what about my interest in the Wächters as individuals? I suppose in some way, that interest is also connected to the legal issues of crimes against humanity and genocide. The former is about individuals, the latter is about groups. And if we're on the subject of groups, is there any group that is more important than the family? As regards Otto, I start the rap line with a quotation from the wonderful Spanish novelist Javier Cercas. It is more important to understand the butcher than the victim. Serkas told me. Why did Otto do what he did? And this is perhaps the big question that I and so many others are chasing. How could it be that a highly intelligent, educated, cultured human being could become embroiled in acts of mass murder? Why people do things are not questions for the judges who are concerned only with what X or Y did or did not do. But can we, who are so interested in the formalized delivery of criminal justice, also not ask what is surely the bigger question? Why? Warum? Pourquoi? The answers to such questions do not reside in the judgments of courts. They live in personal archives, in letters and diaries, in poems, in drawings, and notes. It's in the personal correspondence that we can find the clues. My own view is that Wächter plainly crossed lines. And one of the big lessons I draw from the research that I was engaged in is that once you cross one line, 
it becomes much easier to cross the next. Already in 1921, Otto Wächter did time. He was convicted for beating up Jews in the streets of Vienna. Once you've crossed that line, it's much easier to cross the next line. He was ideological, he was ambitious, and he was weak. And that is a toxic combination. He was narcissistic. You'll be familiar with that. And of course, there is another conclusion. His evil is not the banality of evil of Hannah Arendt's words. For Otto Wächter knew exactly what he was doing, and he embraced it with passion. The silence of the family documents is testament to the awareness of Otto and Charlotte. And what of Charlotte? In many ways, she is the most fascinating of all the characters in the book. For me, she is its beating heart of this family story of international criminality. For it's crystal clear from the archival material that she knew everything. She was completely complicit. She embraced everything. She loved her man for what he did. And what of Horst? He, of course, is in a state of absolute denial on that which is in the archive and which we now have available to us. How do we begin to understand the nature of his denial, of his fakery? It's love that blinds, and over time, it transforms perceptions of reality, and then reality becomes the new truth. And just like me, Horst was born into a family of silences. When the war ended, he, as Charlotte's favorite child, was chosen to be protected, nourished, loved, and told that his father was a fine and decent man. This is what Charlotte left him in her reminiscences. I am so grateful, she wrote, that there are people still today who have positive things to say about my husband. And she made clear to her son, and I quote again, I do not want my children to believe that he is a war criminal who murdered hundreds of Jews. And Horst doesn't want to believe it either today, even if he knows in his heart of hearts that the facts point in another direction. Together, he and I stood before a site of mass murder near Lviv, and there I could see for myself that the pain on his face was very plain. He doesn't deny what has happened. He doesn't deny his father's connection to the horrors. He doesn't deny his mother's support of the father. It's just that he wants to characterize them differently, as Charlotte did. It's a way of being able to wake up and have a decent day. It's a means of survival, hiding from the truth. Tomorrow, I have to have 50 poles shot, Otto wrote to Charlotte. For Horst, almost unbelievably, that is the proof of the opposite of what it says. You see, Horst said to me once, it says, I have to have them shot, not I want to have them shot. You have no proof that he was complicit. That is Horst's interpretation. But I did find proof in a Warsaw archive. It took three years to find this dreadful image and three dreadful photographs that I decided to put in at the end of the book. Otto Wächter overseeing the act of killing 50 young men. Totally innocent, rounded up because the Fuhrer has ordered that it should happen. This photograph shows a group of 25 young men and boys in the snow waiting to be shot. The next photograph shows the actual moment of execution. And the third photograph shows Otto in charge, the commanding presence in that fine, long, black leather coat that Charlotte loved so very much. I can't share Horst's characterization of the facts. Yet, curiously, I feel an affection for him, and I respect and I honor his open spirit, his willingness to engage in this project with me, to respond to suggestions, 
that looted objects that his mother had passed on to him should perhaps now, 70 years later, be returned to their rightful owners, which he has largely done. And I feel also a sense of anxiety and responsibility for the price he has paid for sharing with me and with the archive in Washington these personal papers, for allowing me to write this book, for cutting himself off as a consequence from so much of the rest of his family. He's paid a big price. And if I'm able to be generous to him, he who protects the reputation of the father who was so deeply involved in the killing of my grandfather's family, it is because I constantly recall a scene early in that BBC documentary film, My Nazi Legacy, the moment when he talks about his sixth birthday in April 1945 and when he starts to weep as he recalls the loss of his childhood. He is a child who has been damaged. He is another victim of that terrible period. The consequences go on, and so do the silence. And that is reflected in the remarkable communications I receive. A month after Die Rattenmühle was published in Germany, on Christmas Day 2020, I received an email from this city, from Vienna. The correspondent introduced herself, I didn't know her, as Marie-Thérèse Arnbaum, a historian and the great-granddaughter of Robert Winterstein, in whose house she lived in the parish of Pötzleinsdorf on the outskirts of this wonderful city. A renowned jurist, Winterstein served as Procurator General, Chief Public Prosecutor of Austria until March 1938 when, following the Nazi takeover and the country's incorporation into the Third Reich, he was fired, stripped of his pension, arrested on Kristallnacht, and deported to Buchenwald, from where he never returned. His family retained a memento of those times, a typewritten letter dated September the 14th, 1938, which ended with a very confident but indecipherable signature. And for decades, the family had wondered who was the person who wrote the letter. 80 years later, the mystery was solved. And Armbon wrote to thank me for writing The Rat Line, a Christmas gift. For my book mentioned her grandfather, one of more than 16,000 Austrian civil servants removed from their posts simply because they were Jewish. The Sauberungsaktion, or cleansing action, was implemented by Otto Wächter, and his signature, my book, had confirmed, graced the unhappy Winterstein family heirloom. But, she wrote, that's not what I'm writing to you about. I'm writing to you because my neighbor and my friend of many years is a granddaughter of Otto Wächter's. What a strange situation, Marie-Thérèse Arnbaum mused. You've known a family for so long. You are on friendly terms, and suddenly there is another connection that radically changes the relationship. Last month, I received a letter from Argentina. Dear Mr. Sands, I have read some parts of your new book. The book had just come out in Argentina. I am Alfredo Reinhardt's granddaughter, the real Alfredo Reinhardt. I have to contact you in order to clear some things up. Please answer me. I am very upset. One thing led to another. We exchanged numerous emails, and I ended up sending her a copy of her grandfather's complete Nazi and SS file. She simply wrote back and said, my grandfather was a wonderful man. Everyone was a member of the Nazi party and the SS. It means nothing. The legacy is a long one, and one about which psychoanalysts have some knowledge. I opened East West Street with a quote from Nicholas Abraham and Maria Torok. 
two Hungarian psychoanalysts who had devoted their lives to the effects on the descendants of injury or catastrophe felt by parents and grandparents. What haunts are not the dead, but the gaps left within us by the secrets of others. And in that spirit, I left the last words of the rat line to a remarkable individual, Magdalena Friederike Wächter, who I wish to honor. She is with us today, another granddaughter of Otto and Charlotte, and the only child of Horst and Jacqueline. My grandfather was a mass murderer, Magdalena Friederike says to me. And I ask her for permission to put that in the book. And she grants me permission. Of course, if she had not granted me permission, I would not have done so, because I knew what the consequences might be. For those six words, Horst has disinherited his daughter. So Horst and I are bonded by a sense of dislocation and to events distant in time and place. Our starting points are different. We're on opposite sides of a shared story. Yet somehow our paths have crossed, and somehow we've arrived at a sort of end point. You could say it's a kind of curious waltz, a constant movement, a sort of double act in which each seeks to lead the other. I'll dance with you in Vienna. I'll be wearing a river's disguise. I'll bury my soul in a scrapbook with the photographs there. And the scrapbook, what does it hold? The secrets, the lies, the love, and the absence of justice. All events have their precise localization in this world, Jan Patochka wrote in 1952. And all realities, a determinate extension. What these events and realities mean, and what they do as a matter of memory and identity, the impact they have on our sense of justice and injustice, doing right and doing wrong, to the secrets of others that haunt us, is another deeply complex matter, one that is relevant in all places in the world, but perhaps in particular here in Vienna. Thank you so much. Philip Sands, thank you very much. Philip has kindly accepted to take some questions and answers before we leave the room. So if you wish to ask a question or give a comment, please raise your hand, introduce yourself, and we will have a microphone that will be coming your way. Yes, please, uh, microphone here, please. May I take the mask off or should I keep it on? I'll keep it on. You could take your mask off to speak, yes. Sure. And please Hi. introduce yourself. I'm Patrick. Hi. Thanks very much for the fascinating lecture. I was going to ask what might seem like quite a practical question, but seems quite interesting anyway. How much money do you think he needed to survive when he was on the run in the mountains? And how would he get the, enough to finance himself? Um, yeah, that's, that's my question. M money was a real problem. It's very clear that the Vechters went from huge amounts of money and well-being and properties and cars and things. And the family was in pretty dire straits immediately after the war. Everything just disappeared. But the family had Charlotta at its head. And Charlotta was a fearsome individual. If you've read the book, you'll know, for example, that very soon after the end of the war, she decided she wanted to get back the family apartment in the original family apartment. They'd been living in a fabulous place, the Villa Mendel, some of you will know. 
and she literally goes to the old family home, knocks on the door, is introduced, meets the people inside who are the Association of Concentration Camp Survivors and persuades them to leave immediately. You couldn't invent this person. Um, she talks a lot about difficulties with money. She needs to sell. They've obviously, should we say, obtained various objects over the course of the last five years. I mean, there's a famous scene in 1939 where she walks into the National Gallery of Krakow with a piece of paper signed by Otto which says, my wife can take everything she wants for the family home, and she does. Uh, Horst and I had a remarkable visit a few years back to the uh, Kunsthistorisches Museum, and we stood between one painting which may or may not have come from uh, that uh, collection, or at least it was a, a Bruegel, and it wasn't clear whether she had nicked from Krakow one by Bruegel the older or Bruegel the younger. That was not specified. And she slowly sold this stuff off. And with the proceeds, in real impecuniosity, she would toddle off every couple of weeks um, by bus and by foot and literally climb two and a half thousand meters up to the Hagener Hütte in these extraordinary wilderness places where she'd arranged to meet her husband, bringing food and provisions and shoes and in winter clothing and so on and so forth. And of course, all of that had to be paid for. I think it was, I think it was a very, very tough time. Uh, the, the, the documents make that pretty clear. And I think they were pretty impecunious. But they held on to stuff. And some of that stuff, I am told, still exists today. Charlotta had the habit of, on the occasion of each of her five children's marriage, giving the child an item, which of course had been obtained in the previous uh, existence. And Horst has pretty much given everything back. There is a tea service which the Mendels, the Bettina Mendel family in Australia want back, and we're waiting for COVID to come to an end that it can be transported uh, back to Australia. But other siblings have not given it back and have turned on Horst for his treachery in publicizing this fact and not giving the material back. So you can see from these kinds of episodes that it's very complex with Horst. It's, it's, it's not black and white. He's done some admirable and very decent things. And I've tried to be as fair as I can in setting out the story. Any other questions? <laughs> If not, please... Oh, Shalini, sorry, and I didn't see and you. At the, and at the back on the right also, there's a gentleman at the back. All right. Philip, I do have a question, which is a personal one to you. At several points in the lecture, you said, this is a journey for you, it's about identity. And I was wondering why that is the narrative that is so important for you to frame this story, rather than to say there is a story about justice, justice denied to family who were murdered, and that it's not just about identity, but it's also the, the child in you, but the lawyer in you, who is looking for culpability, some responsibility, and some sense of closure. No, you've hit a nerve here. Um, I think that's very astute. I I'm quite clear that the way this journey started was really to know who I really was. Because when you grow up in a family of silences, as I did, when, you know, we were not allowed to have German or Austrian things in our house as kids. It was, you know, lots of people recall that. But we were never really told why, what exactly had happened, you know, what was going on. And so there was this gap that, you know, we sort of had a connection with these weird places, Vienna and Lemberg. And, but no one would say what those connections were or whether there was a continuing connection. And so the story very much began, I want to find my grandfather's house because I want to know who he was. And if I know who he is, then I'll know better who I am. And that's been achieved. 
But one thing led to another. That was the starting point. I didn't go into this looking for the origins of crimes against humanity and genocide and finding these strange coincidences or going on my own sort of personal, you know, Clint Eastwood type justice trail holding to account. But I think I have to recognize, and that's why I think your point is really well put. I've got to tweak the narrative a bit. I think it's fair to say that this book and this lecture is a recording of the judgment that Otto Wächter never got. It, 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 it is a way of filling the gap. I think that's right, of filling the gap. I, but I haven't articulated it in that way. And I think the reason that I haven't articulated it in that way may be because I'm slightly uncomfortable about it. Precisely because I believe very strongly that the successors, the children, the grandchildren, do not have responsibility for what their grandfather and grandmother did. And I think, incidentally, she is complicit in the entire thing. And I don't want to stand with them and meet with them like some guy who's on the hunt for justice. Because I think that when you're talking with someone and in conversation with someone, you have to be honest about what it is you're up to. And it, if I'm talking to you about what I'm doing and I say, well, I'm trying to understand what happened, to understand who I am, that's one thing. The moment you say I'm on a hunt for justice, people go, Ooh talk to that person because he's loopy or whatever. I mean, that's, that's the concern. And so I wonder whether it's a technique I've created for myself to make the exercise that I've engaged in less difficult. I think people react differently to someone who announces they're looking to identify who they are than someone who's on the road to justice. But your question pushes at an open door. It's plain. There is an element of that. But I've not presented it to myself as that, and I haven't presented it to people that I've talked with as that. But I think you're basically right. <laughs> there was also someone, someone at the back over there on the right at some point, anyway, that you put your hand up. Thank you very much. Uh, another person was probably before me, but I wanted to follow up Asad Rising of Karachini from the University of uh, Vienna. So you're kind of contradicting yourself a little bit because one point that you made was that whoever was not judged at Nuremberg or in one of the other trials kind of has the aura of not being guilty because what is not being done, those that are not guilty must be innocent. But then maybe there is another way of bringing up those stories and maybe those people do not completely escape justice, even if it's not a justice before a court or tribunal, but in the story that we tell in the narrative that remains. Thank you. Uh, firstly, I've got no problem at all with being told that certain things that I do, many things that I do, are contradictory because I think a lot of things we do as human beings are contradictory. We're pulled in different directions. It is true that when Horst says to me, my father was not convicted by a court, national or international, at the moment of his death, he therefore died an innocent man, the lawyer in me says, yeah, you're right. But I'm not only a lawyer, I'm also a human being. And as a human being and a grandson, I can take myself out of the legal construct and engage in a different exercise. And I think this again goes back to issues of identity. You know, for 25 years I wrote legal books and I loved writing legal books, academic books. And, and, and these kinds of things, these kinds of doors are not doors that I would have opened. But the moment you allow a hint of the personal to be introduced into an activity that would otherwise be purely scholarly or professionally legal, you do expose yourself to the charge of contradiction. And I think that's also probably right. There is a contradiction between Philippe Sands, the lawyer, who says, and would be bound to say, 
At the moment of his death, Otto Wächter was an innocent man. But Philippe Sands, the grandson, does not believe that at the moment of his death, Otto Wächter was an innocent man. He was a mass murderer. And there is a contradiction there. But it's a contradiction, I think, that is inherent in each of us, where different parts of our lives come into conflict. And I think it's better to be honest about that, actually. I think it's better to recognize that each of us have multiple identities. I mean, in what context am I doing this exercise? I happen to have a British and a French passport. But actually, if you go back into the family origins, I'm more Austrian than British or French. No one's been born in France in my family. It's all a naturalization process. But we can trace back family you know, through 172 years of Austro-Hungarian empire, if you like. So who am I? Am I engaging in this activity as a Brit or as a, an Austrian in everything but formal identity? I, I don't know. These, these contradictions are really complex. I think each of you knows what I'm talking about because every human being has all of these multiple identities which pull us and push us in different directions. So I'm, I've got no problem with contradiction, but there is a contradiction. A tension, I would say a tension. Hello. Um, uh, my question is, um, did you ever have the feeling that uh, Otto, uh, um, Horst, was trying to edit or leave away anything, or that the conversation you had with him would be very different if you would, would, have, would be Austrian or come from a different cultural background. So was there this, ever this feeling that he was somewhat fabricating or, or, or not revealing his truth self? I have reason to believe that some of the archive has been filleted, which is an English term to say, you know, it's like you take the bones out of a fish, and that I suspect at some point someone went through the documents and thought, mm, that photograph is not so great, we might want to remove that one. I mean, it's odd. You know, the greatest day in your life is standing on the balcony with the Führer, but there's no photograph of yours truly standing on the balcony with the Führer. So I think it's pretty odd that the photographs that make it into the album don't include certain things that I think probably existed. Otto's instruction to Charlotta on the last day of the war, he called her and he said, destroy all the professional papers. She obviously had loads of files at home which dealt with his work. And the son, the oldest son, Otto Senior, Otto Junior, uh, dumped it all in Lake Zell. So it's at the bottom of Lake Zell. There are gaps in the diaries. There's a couple of important years missing. 1939, the diaries, I haven't seen them. I, I think Horst has been absolutely straight with me. Um, the letter from December 1939 isn't in the archive on the Holocaust Memorial website. It wasn't included amongst the documents. And he'd shown it to me at one point, and I remembered it for obvious reasons. And I asked him about that letter, and I asked whether he could have a copy, and whenever I asked for something, he always sent it. So I don't think he has been involved. I think he's been really a straight shooter on the substantive materials, but I think it may be organized in such a way that things have cropped up in other places. There's the big mystery of the family home movies, which are said to have fallen out of the back of a car on a journey when someone left the boot open. That seems to me to be slightly improbable. And I think they reside somewhere. I've done a couple of events in the last two days, yesterday and today, yesterday at the Freud Museum, today with other colleagues on the question of, of silence. And this is what I think is so interesting about the silences in the families, that one of the grandchildren 
has reached out to me. But isn't it remarkable that out of 23 grandchildren, there's only one who's reached out to me publicly. The other, well, I have had communications with a couple of others, but they've made it clear it has to be private and behind the scenes and it can't be described or talked about or written about. And I've respected that, of course. It's covered in silence. And so I suspect there is more stuff there. But I don't think it's Horst who has edited or, 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 or prepared documents in particular. I think he's really been a straight shooter. And I really respect what he has done very much. Any, any more questions? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Can we take these three together, then? Thank you a lot for your lecture. I think you can take your mask off for one minute. Okay. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about uh, the institutional silences in this story, because I think it was not in your lecture, but uh, in this extraordinary podcast, about the institutions, their involvement and culpability, and how for many of these institutions there remain, basically, their, their activities covered in silence, both that were implicit in the, during the Nazi regime, but also that emerged afterwards. Catholic Church, other agency that became trapped in the Cold War. And so I wanted to ask how you see this part of the story and possible developments on this side. Thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Vlasta Cordova, and I would like to ask you, um, the first question is very specific. In, you, in your book, in Red Line, you mentioned that Charlotte had abortion, if I could remember, yeah. and it was in Berlin after 1933. So um, I was wondering if you found out how she did it, because it was illegal and it was uh, against um, Aryan race laws. And the second question was really similar to was one of my colleagues, so maybe I will switch the phone. Okay. Yes. Hello, my name is Elizabeth, and actually, um, I think my, my question was the same one as the colleague here, because I was an avid listener of the podcast, and I was just intrigued because you mentioned that the Vatican seemed to be very open when you went to Rome to see the place where um, Otto Wächter died, so I was just wondering about Alois Hudal and how the Vatican, uh, how open the Vatican was about discussing his role or showing documents. Mm. Uh, so I think it mm. reflected your question, actually. Sure. Thank you for these wonderful questions. Yes, you've, you've mentioned something. I should have mentioned it also, that after the film, um, once I'd had the materials, that this, pro this part of the project originally began when the BBC asked me to make a podcast, and that podcast series came out in 2018. And it was only in the process of beginning the making of that podcast that... The, my editor at Weidenfeld and Nicholson in London said, well, why don't you write a book about it? I hadn't intended to write a book about it, but I'm now very glad that I did. You can all listen to the podcast. It's free. It's on the BBC website. It's called The Rat Line. You just Google BBC The, the Rat Line. It's 10 parts. It's, it's free. It's been downloaded more than 7 million times around the world. It gives you a sense of the level of interest in this kind of... Um, of subject matter. Um, institutions, of course, have silences, and, and you've mentioned one, um, the church. Again, it's really complicated. I think I've been helped a lot by, my, sort of by being a lawyer and being very careful with the words that one uses. So I never say in the book or any lecture the Vatican helped Otto Wächter, because I don't have evidence that the Vatican helped Otto Wächter. I only have evidence that one or two bishops helped Otto Wächter. And I think that, again, it's the individual and the group. We don't know what Pius XII knew or did not know. Gita Sereni, the celebrated author, writer, historian, in her book about Stangl, interviewed another bishop who described to her how Pius XII had given little sums of money to help 
Nazi refugees, little sums of money to uh, Bishop Hudal. But again, I don't, you know, one of the things you learn when you're in court is don't over pull the evidence. That doesn't prove the Pope knew or exactly what he was supporting. And so equally, when one comes to the modern day, 2019, I've been helped by a couple of bishops. The circumstances are quite interesting. I couldn't get in to the Santo Spirito. Actually, I think probably for perfectly decent reasons, it was being renovated. I don't think that, I never really thought there was anything suspicious about it. It was, it was being, re it happened to be being renovated between 2015 and 2000, 2019, well, in fact, right up to 2020. And I mentioned to a friend of mine, the writer Javier Cercas, that I would, who is, I, if you haven't read Cercas, read Cercas. He's an extraordinary writer. Um, it's the, 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 the fine line between fact and fiction. I just start with Soldiers of Salamis, um, a single moment during the Spanish Civil War. And I, said, I was sort of on a panel once with Javier, and he said, what are you writing? And I said, oh, I'm trying to get into the Santo Spirito. Don't suppose you know anyone in the Vatican, do you? He said, no, no, but about six months later, he rang up and said, oh, the Pope has just invited me to give a lecture on faith and literature. He said, even though I wasn't a believer, it was good enough for them that my mother was, and I went to Rome to give the lecture. And... While I was there, he said, after the lecture, there was a cocktail party. And, well, at this point, I'd become involved in the story. And in the course of the cocktail, he was speaking to the head of culture, Portuguese cardinal, and to an Irish bishop, Paul Tigre, about, uh, you know, this, his, somehow I came up in conversation, the Santo Spiritu, Javier was interested in it. And the Irish bishop said, Philippe Sands, I think I know that name. Javier said, you think you know that name? He said, yeah, isn't he the bloke who made a podcast for the BBC? <laughs> and Javier said, yes. And um, Bishop Tigo said, not very friendly about the Vatican, but I loved it. <laughs> and, and he said, call him now and tell him to come to Rome tomorrow morning and I'll get him in. And that was what happened. And in fact, it was an astonishing journey that we made because um, we were invited early to the Vatican and we were asked, would you like to go and see the Sistine Chapel, just the two of you? Yeah, we would like to go and see the Sistine Chapel, just the two of us. So we were just allowed in, like at 7.30 in the morning. And we were just sitting there and I sort of turned to him and said, why are you so interested in the victors? And he said, because it's more important to know the butcher than the victim. That was said in the Sistine Chapel. And, and then we went off together to that incredible room that you saw. It's extraordinary. I mean, in my cases, I always go to the places because it opens the imagination. You can imagine someone's last day looking at the inscriptions on the ceiling and lying there and in suffering, and it, it helps. And this pope bless him, has decided to open the archives. I have to say, it was the most extraordinary visit. I went into the secret archive. I was given a private tour, told not to take any photographs, not to write about it, which I've respected. Um, and I just saw the most amazing things, including, just to share with you, um, rows and rows, thousands of meters long, Every single act of dissolution by a marriage approved by a pope since the 13th century. Everyone having a file like this, that is not being opened. But what has now been opened, but because of COVID, researchers slow down, is the material which will allow researchers like David Kurtzer and others to find out what Pius XII and others did or did not know. But at this point, I think there's a move towards openness, a move in some quarters towards ending silences, but it's a very slow 
game. On the question of Charlotte's abortions, she certainly had three abortions because she writes about it in her memoirs. And she gives some detail. You can go onto the material. It's all on the, it's all on the web now, so you can go and read it for yourselves. And the abortions were engaged in for different reasons at different times. By the end of the war, it was not to increase another increase the burden on the family, costs and these other things. But at an earlier stage, it was in part to punish her husband. So, for example, this is a slightly different story, but it's related. She arrives in Berlin in 36. They've been separated for two years. He's been there since the 25th of July, 34. He's had to flee after the Dolphus killing. And she arrives and she discovers he's having an affair with a young German lady called Trauter. And she's furious, she makes him end the relationship, and then discovers that she is pregnant. And a few months later, she bears a child, their third child, who is a girl. And she writes in her diaries, I decided to name her Trauter to punish Otter. Okay, so pause for a moment and imagine the impact on that child to understand why she had been named as she had been named and the relationship between the father and that child. I mean, it's these tiny points of detail that enable you, I think, to begin to understand how human beings operate in these circumstances. So the amount of detail is very significant in some cases and that material I think you, you can go into yourself and, and have a look if you're interested. You have been very generous with your time. Thank you very much for doing that. So please join me in thanking Philippe Sainte once again. <laughs>